well dear friends uh, welcome back to our program uh, the joint program of asha and ganga jamni as you know that each week we pick up two themes one from our shared past and another a study of our sources today uh, we have amongst us professor mana kia who has written a very remarkable book persian itself memories of place and origin before nationalism professor kia is an associate professor in the department of middle eastern south asian and african studies at columbia university she received her phd from harvard university her interests include the connective social cultural intellectual histories of west central and south asia from 17 to 18 centuries with a particular focus on indo persian literary culture and social history she has recently published the book which she is going to analyze today before us this book explores how early modern conceptions of place and origins provided expansive possibilities of persian selfhood professor kia is working on a second book which outlines how a shared sense of aesthetic and ethical form that is adab uh, as culture was imagined and enacted in the trans regional circulation of people texts and ideas between iran and hindustan with these brief words i would like to invite professor manakia before you and ask her to speak on her book please uh, and tell us what she has actually written there what she means by the term uh, uh, you know persian uh, because uh, i mean in her book she tries to differentiate between iranian and persian and uh, uh, she would be explaining those divisions and of course the relationship of the persian culture with the indian subcontinent professor manakia thank you adab arz uh, many thanks um professor nadim rezavi and the aligarh society of history and archaeology for this invitation and to ms shagufta sidi for technical support um so the the this first slide here um shows you the cover of the book um and just by way of introduction as you may know persian was the dominant language of the islamic east and used by muslims and non-muslims alike from the 14th to the 19th century it was the language of power and learning across central south and west asia used for government philosophy sufi literature historical commemoration storytelling poetry and ethical literature as a result a heavy and continuous circulation of people texts practices and ideas connected persianate asia this mobility sustained a shared cultural hermeneutics across these regions that could be taken up by rulers to form imperial ideologies utilized by merchants in everyday transactions or invoked by mendicants in their peregrinations persianate sensibilities had to be acquired because one was never born with them persians were thus a kind of person who had received a particular form of basic education that imparted the persianate this is something this is a term that means a certain kind of um sort of cultural um formation uh, so through which they imparted the persianate through which they understood and engaged with the world 
Persian was a textual corpus whose encapsulated meanings also lived and circulated orally in stories and in verse for broader audiences. I argue that Persians were possessors of the Persian language. They learned adab uh, through its verses and stories. And by adab, I, this was sort of how to behave at appropriate moments with, for instance, gratitude or generosity, when it was called for and towards whom. Adab was the proper form of things and of being in the world. This concept of proper aesthetic and ethical forms of thinking, acting, and speaking, and thus of perceiving, desiring, and experiencing provided the coherent logic of being Persian. What was proper to one context was relational. It could be inappropriate to another context. To learn these forms, to identify their appropriate moments, and to inhabit them successfully was to be an ideal Persian. Not everyone was ideal, <laughs> uh, but through their longing for it, people belonged. So here we have uh, a, a sort of map of empires around 1700. Now, my book is not a story of empires, but it's helpful to kind of understand the political state of things. Um, and this is likely to be familiar. Here we have the Mughal Empire um, in this um, yellow color. Um, but the, the historical frame, this is the map I actually use um, in my book. And it's one that I purposefully had made without political borders, um, which I think is appropriate uh, given how much was in flux uh, across the long 18th century, but also because I wanted to tell a story where political determinism was suspended to bring another kind of picture into focus. Um, and these are the three major regions, Hindustan, Iran, Turan, and there's Rum over there. Um, and these are the larger regions. And then in the smaller capital letters, we have the smaller domains. Um, which were very important, as well as the names of cities. Um, and this is mainly the names of cities that I mention in my book. There are obviously many more, but not all of them would fit. Um, so now the cover of my book is a picture of Homayun and Tahmasp's first encounters, right? Of Timurid and Safavid kings and their entourages. And um, what is usually called, uh, what are usually called Mughals, I call Timurids, which were actually their family name. And I do this for a reason I'll explain a bit later. Um, so while my book is not about kings, this was a scene that was repeatedly remembered in the centuries to come in a variety of accounts for various reasons and in particular ways. The adab required by this relationship, depending on how it was depicted, was a site for political and moral claims. This illustration of their first encounter is specifically from the Akbar Nome, where Tahmas receives Homayun in front of his capital um, of Ghazvin. And this is when Homayun had sort of been run, pushed out um, of Hindustan by uh, Sher Shah Suri. Um, so it, it, the, the reason I like it is the picture kind of shows it, um, a kind of seamless coming together in the form of a shared culture, but also of contestation. Here, Homayun is shown as wearing his own royal cap rather than the Safavid Taj he controversially was said to have accepted in exchange for Tahmasp's help. Um, both rulers are depicted as seated next to each other, closely turned towards one another in intimacy, and both holding the handkerchiefs that would have identified them as beloveds. And also, um, this was a way of identifying Sufi masters. Um, uh, they were both beloveds and masters of this audience, um, foregrounded and framed as they are in, in the picture by their entourages. Now I've been captivated by this image for a number of years and thought this simultaneous homology and uh, contesting distinction was a perfect representation for my book. So to kind of step back out um, in general, the main question animating my work is what kinds of histories, meaning worlds, ties and divisions 
do we see when we look beyond nationalist and regional frames to the thick and deep past connecting various parts of Asia together? Now, I realize that speaking of connections runs the risk of romanticizing a cosmopolitan pre-modern, but I, usually, I write in the usual context of scholarship that assumes divisions, uh, knowing and knowing what was shared seems essential to a truly historicized understanding of what was not. Um, when I began this work, much of what I read um, was still evaluated, still evaluated the period before the rise of colonial modernity with categories, terms, and understandings belonging to this later period. Um, this kind of move seemed limited to me um, because categories are important. And if you begin with too many assumptions, you generally find what you're looking for at the risk of obscuring everything else that does not fit and might change its meaning. Um, and anyway, we cannot assume colonial modernity was as much of a rupture as it claims to be. After all, Sheldon Pollock has pointed out, how can we know what colonialism and its forms of knowing changed if we don't know what was there before? So the book presents an argument about what place and origin meant for Persians across in India in the 18th century between the fall of the Safavids in 1722 and when the British abolished official use of Persian in India in the 1830s. Specifically, I outline how the expansive and multiple notions of place and of origin allowed for a range of possibilities of collective affiliation out of which the pre-modern Persianate selves grew. I bring together works usually understood as separate genres, biographical compendiums, travelogues, histories, memoirs, and poetry under the heading of commemorative texts based on their shared imperative of commemoration as well as common forms and features. The same overarching logic of diversity, of difference legible as coherence, govern the range of possible conceptions of place and origin. Ultimately, I argue that multiple places and origins, a diversity understood as proper and necessary, constituted a range of Persianate collectives and their selves that crossed modern boundaries. Pre-nationalist Persians were from many lands, religions, occupations, social locations, and even genders, though these boundaries possessed apparatic rather than categorical distinctions that require reassessment of their historical meanings. And by apparatic, I mean that they do not have hard and fast mutually exclusive distinctions. They are interpermeable and they are distinct even as they're connected. So this is the table of contents of the book. So the central premise of place, section one of the book, is that the overarching logic of modern empirical geography was but one possible mode of knowing place. Because it was embedded in and continuous with other modes of knowing place that were different and even undermined empiricism, we cannot view it as definitive. The three chapters in this section address the significance of different scales of place, the possible modes of place making, and the way places were invested with meaning. Chapter one, uh, Landscapes, begins by outlining the flexibility and multivalence of terms. It distinguishes common ways of understanding units of geographical place, such as kingdoms and provinces, from effective notions of place, such as homelands. The chapter then parses the ways that places were marked and measured. Chapter two, Remembering Lamenting, illustrates the role of commemorating the near and far past in attributing meaning to 18th century presence that were marked by the fall of the Safavid empire and the devolution of Timurid power for Persians in and between Iran and India. Different interpretations of contemporary events remark 
um, evince remarkably similar understandings of lands, geographies, and their relations to other places, all with reference to proper ethical forms in learning, service, rulership, social interaction, and piety. So chapter three, Placemaking and Proximity, looks at the cartographic effects of meaning making and features of place that lent them a moral cast. Widely recognized features of urbanity, learning, just rule, and the storied tradition of Persian and Islamic narratives connected the universal with the local and particular. Trans-regionally circulating commemorations of place created a morally imbued sense of familiarity and proximity more significant than, geographical, than empirical geographical contiguity. Other features of place could create gradients of familiarity with places within and beyond both Persianate and Islamic lands. So um, I'm going to give a, a, an example of what I mean by this. Um, I'm going to give one example from each of the, the kind of two sections of the book, but also um, uh, linger a bit on the seventh chapter, which brings uh, a number of ideas together. So um, when the Timurids conquered Kashmir and incorporated it into their North Indian-based empire in the early 17th century, they represented it as paradise-like, and these are familiar images. Um, they then extended its heavenly nature, seen in its lush greenery and temperate climate, further adorned with gardens and pavilions, to characterize the whole of the empire. This characterization as the exemplar of paradise on earth became a defining ornament of Kashmir as a place and incorporated into universal Persianate knowledge. In the mid 18th century, when Abdel Karim Kashmiri, a minor Timurid functionary based in Delhi, but born in Kashmir, wrote about his travels through Iran, he used this universally known feature of Kashmir to create linkages with Mazandaran, a small region in Iran. So this is a, um, this is a sort of famous text that he writes, um, and he's a functionary that travels through Iran with Nader Shah's army um, on his way to Hajj. Um, and this is about the mid 18th century. Though Abdel Karim's affiliation is clearly with Kashmir and Timurid ruled Hindustan more broadly, the specificity of Kashmir's paradise like qualities do not preclude the same in other places. It was part of a broader universal idiom of Persianate imperial power that marked certain places similarly through homology. One parallel between Kashmir and Mazandaran allows us to ponder what the center might have been in an early modern Persianate context in which millennial sovereignty was simultaneously claimed by Safavid and Timurids. In his account, local knowledge is something he sifts through, sometimes incorporating, sometimes rejecting, according to more trans-regionally recognized knowledge about Mazandaran. He begins his account by stating, it has been heard from credible people that in the past, because of the great number of trees and abundant undergrowth, the way to Mazandaran from Astarabad was extremely inaccessible and travelers had complete difficulty coming and going. Because the Safavid dynasty, especially Shah Abbas, was nobly filled with a desire to regularly visit Mazandaran, they therefore uprooted the trees along the way and built 12 halting stations on a road made of stone and mortar. At every halting station, they built a structure so that it would not be necessary for a tent because of the fact that rainfall becomes quite heavy there, as is the case in Bengal. This is local knowledge, the previous state of the passage between Astarabod and Mazandaran, the changes wrought by the erstwhile Safavids, and information about the climate, which he likens for his audience to Bengal, where many of his immediate readers in Delhi would not have been to either, but would know as a place of heavy rainfall. This is local knowledge articulated in a way familiar to his Hindustani audience. He transfers the script according to which the Timurids had territorialized their authority 
to explain the Safavid relationship to their own paradise-like land. Abdel Karim marks Mazandaran's similitude with Kashmir by noting that just as the emperors Jahangir and Shah Jahan would often go with their entourages to Kashmir, likewise Shah Abbas would go to Mazandaran, quote, with some of his intimates and attendants for feasting and enjoyment, end quote. The two places are framed not just by their similar natural beauty, but also because they act as paradise-like destinations for the contemporary, contemporaneous kings of two Persianate dynasties who held them in special regard as places to pass certain seasons. This is universal knowledge. A host of people who had never been near it, including Persians writing in Iran, referred to Kashmir as, as a paradise-like place of temperate weather and heavenly gardens. And you see this reference very commonly in Persian texts written in Iran as well by people who had never been to Hindustan. That a Timurid functionary could recognize and articulate this kind of imperial placemaking among Safavids also speaks to trans-regionally legible and shared political practices. With respect to Mazandaran's um, built environment, Abdul Karim waxes lyrical about Ashraf, a site of Shah Abbas's gardens where, quote, at night, the song of crashing waves and the uproar of the sea are heard and are the accustomed sound for the inhabitants, close quote. However noteworthy it may be, Abdul Karim nevertheless relates that the locals refer to the Caspian as Gulzum, and that this was wrong, citing textual sources in support of his authority. Kashmiri's Persian education and its shared traditions of knowledge, gotten however far away, here corrects local knowledge. While Kashmiri levels the claim of error, it is not meant in the sense of a truth whose meaning cancels out another according to a categorical distinction of mutual exclusivity. Following a commemorative tradition of including multiple historical narratives of relative verifiability about the past and its meaning, he still includes this local knowledge as part of what Mazandaron is, in addition to the more universally recognized correct information he provides alongside of it. Both are worthy of commemoration. Abdel Karim's view of Mazandaran's people is quite sympathetic. After telling us the foods they eat, including their wondrously sweet bread, he claims that the people of Iran tell strange tales with regard to the inhabitants of Mazandaran about their simpleness. More likely, the strange tales are in spite of the Mazandaranese elegantly adorned characters and in truth have no basis or else because, since they call Mazandaran paradise-like, um, and uses Behisht Nishan, it will be for this very reason that the people of heaven are simpletons. It is an amazing coincidence that in Hindustan, they call Kashmir, Janat Nazir, and in Iran, they call Mazandaran Behisht Nishan. And because of these paradise-like Nisses, the people of both domains of Iran and Hindustan, subject the poor Kashmiris and Mazandaranis to much abuse. So Kashmir and Mazandaran are not the same, but their domains are synonymously paradise-like as Behisht and Janat. Accordingly, the relationships of their inhabitants vis-a-vis -vis the rest of their respective empires and their domain's significance for its imperial rulers is also homologous. Significant here is not Abdul Karim's sympathy towards his subject, but the parallelism he draws between his Kashmiri homeland and the envied and abused people of Mazandaran. It articulates an intimate similitude based on geographical and political homology. His privileging of universal knowledge inscribes hierarchical valuation to be sure but including local knowledge alongside and within a framework of homology avoids Orientalism's production of alterity or effacing domestication of what was conflictual and thus threatening. 
Significantly, Abdar Karim's universalizing amendments to local knowledge were enacted by a Hindustani Persian on a Safavid locality, disrupting anachronistic associations of Iran as the authoritative center of Persianate ways of knowing. But in the midst of this correction, our universal Persian is also simultaneously a Hindi speaker and a local Kashmiri, empathizing with Mazandarani's plight in Iran. The text reader is clearly in Timurid Hindustan. He provides the names of local flora and fauna in Iran, um, and then their local Hindi equivalents. For all that Abdul Karim treats Timurid Hindustan as his Persianate center, his implied reader also has a locality, which he addresses by translating Iran's local knowledge into a Hindustani vernacular. Both scales of local knowledge, that of the smaller domain and of the imperial realm, in turn lie easily alongside transregional universal Persianate knowledge. According to Persianate geocultural understanding, certain places like Kashmir were understood to be paradise-like whether or not an author had been there or the place was within the smaller or larger domain to which they were affiliated. The chapters in part two examine the meaning and labor of origins among Persians in Safavid Iran and Timurid India, outside of the binary of native and foreigner. I begin with the common modern assumption that a homeland in, Safav in the Safavid kingdom established a primordial proto-Iranian loyalty that marked all migrants to India, even those in Timurid imperial service. Modern scholarship possesses limited conceptual means by which to understand origins outside of mutually exclusive categories taken to be a definitive of affiliation. Place is given prominence along with religion, nationality, and ethnicity. As with place, I argue that modern categories are either not definitive or else entirely inappropriate. And here I'm referencing um, the sort of very uh, uh, common and uh, frequent migration and circulation of people between Iran and India, and the especially the migration from Central Asia and Iran to India and um, the kind of participation in various local uh, and imperial political systems, both in Mughal domains, but also in the Deccan. Um, so chapter four, lineages and their places, argues that the form of origin was lineage, multifariously constituted. Alongside territorialized notions of origin, there were often far more important lineages, including those of service, learning, aesthetics, and practice, which call into question our understanding of meaningful connection. So let me provide examples from two 18th century Persians writing in Aurangabad. Um, I, and here I'm referencing Azad Bilgrami's uh, biography of Morshid Khali Khan uh, demonstrates the way uh, the learned lineage, the way learned lineage fits into the overall story of origin. And here we have um, lineages of places lying alongside natal lineages, along with these other kinds of lineages that were a little bit less used to understanding. Um, so, quote, his original name is Mirza Lutfullah. His father, Haji Shukrullah Tabrizi, entered Hindustan from the land of Iran and established his residence at the port of Surat. Morshid Ghali Khan was born in Surat in the year, um, I'll use the 1684, after he had arrived at the age of cognition. He was at the service of Agha Habibullah Esfahani, one of the established men of learning resident in Surat, who was one of the senior students of the prominent Safavid scholar, Agha Hossein Khansadi. Born in Surat, Morshid Ghali Khan had links elsewhere. He was a son of a migrant from Safavid domains and educated by another migrant in Surat, who was the student of one of the most illustrious late Safavid ulama. The benefits of 
of this kind of service included location in a learned lineage, learned lineage that appears across Timurid domains. The other half of the entry uh, mirrors these exalted origins with details of illustrious patrons and high positions in Bengal and Hyderabad. Here, late Safavid learned lineages are rooted in the Persianate sites of the subcontinent. Learning and service were amongst the most important lineages that commemorated origin. In the preface to his Taskere, or biographical compendium, Golerana, Lakshmi Narayan describes himself as, quote, pen named Shafir Orangabadi who from the beginning of eternity has His Excellency Azad Bilgrami's brand of servitude on his forehead. Writing in Orangabad, he identifies himself as Orangabadi, which when uttered in that place seems to indicate an immutable and autonomous native identification. Yet Shafiq is speaking to an audience broader than his own locale. He calls himself Orangabadi, speaking to Persians from elsewhere or, or in another locale. He introduces himself with a proper name, a pen name, and a place name moniker before distinguishing himself as literally marked by his teacher. Sayyid Qulam Ali Azad Bilgrami is the noted poet, scholar, and participant of the prominent Nakhshbandi Takya of Orangabad. Shafiq's relationship with this teacher is a lineage of knowledge, part of his origin. Later in his biography, before any mention of his own birth, he narrates this story. Um, Shafiq, pen named Lakshmi Narayan Mathur, the author of these places, is of the Katri Kapoor people. His grandfather, Bhavani Das, accompanied Alamgir's camp from Lahore to the Deccan. He laid the colors of settlement in Aurangabad and entered into the relationship of service. He achieved great honor in this work and came to be possessed of children. His middle son, Rai Mansaram, who is the father of the author, was 10 years old when Bhavani Das gathered his things for his last journey. The father was educated in the shadow of Lala Jaswant Rai's affection, a man who is both a grandfather and qualified in science and learning. In the time of Nawab Asaf, Nawab Asaf Jah, he was appointed to the deputyship of the administration of the six districts of the Deccan. And until the time of writing, he continues in this work for what is now 40 years. The deceased Nawab Samsamud Dole Bahadur Orangabadi who was unmatched in his day in sociability and beneficence in the days of his deputyship, granted him a mansab at the request of His Excellency Azad Bilgrami. Favored with the deputyship of the paymastership of the Deccan, he incorporated service to the dervishes with service to the nobles. He always observed the manner of conferring the kindness of favors, and my father accomplished both forms of dignified service according to all the necessary customs. Shafiq's origins are in terms of what we would call jati, not a term he uses, and paternal ancestry, alongside and intertwined with lineages of teachers and patrons. His origins and their names, Katri Kapuri, uh, Lahori and Orangabadi, imperial and paternal, come together to make him a Hindu, a Timurid administrator, and a Persian man of letters. Prominent in this story is his father's mastery of adab as social ethics appropriate to his location in imperial administrative service, a product of many other relationships. Mansaram's perfect enactment of the expected customs of conduct towards all kinds of people from the masters of the hidden world, dervishes, to those of this manifest world, nobles, indicate the basis of Shafir's own learned potential as a master of adab. Shafir's account of his origins is typical in its primary emphasis on genealogies and in the specifics of his occupation. In the midst of these origins, place appears but does not alone constitute origin. Rather, place was almost always bound up in other kinds of lineages and almost never singularly given. 
So chapter five, Kinship Without Ethnicity, looks at pre-modern notions of social con collectives, commonly called tribes or ethnicities. Dispensing with these terms, I historicize social collectives through the adab of their telling. I find connection between various lineages of birth, legal status, and other formal socially regulated relationships. The variety of lineages constituting origin require a consideration of kinship that dislodges law and birth as definitive. A historicized reading of origins thus defies modern categories like nation, ethnicity, or tribe, and requires instead a reconsideration of kinship that dispenses with anachronistic notions of biological truth. Chapter six, naming and its affiliations, takes the previous chapter's more expansive notion of kinship and considers the ways in which naming captured the possibilities of affiliation. In particular, I elaborate on the regionally specific ways in which Persians called themselves and each other and how trans-regional circulation accommodated such specificities in the lineaments of the universal. Names of both individuals and collectives linked people to groups and to each other in ways that were relational, contextual, and thus belie the discrete mutual exclusivity of modern categorization. The seventh and last chapter turns to commemoration and what it can tell us about collectives and selves. As empires fell, and societies faced dispersal across the 18th century, practices of commemoration proliferated. This last chapter focuses on Tuskida writing, on biographical compendia, um, in the aftermath of imperial devolution, focusing on the proliferation of these texts and the insight they offer into possibilities for articulating collectives and selves. Specifically, I look at poetic Tuskidas, which commemorate aesthetically and socially constituted collectives of Persians. They included past and contemporary poets as part of an imagined community of ancestors and peers in which were nested clusters of social relationships. Constituted by historically specific authorial concerns and limitations, the sheer number and diversity of such texts enable understanding of the many possible ways these collectives could be imagined and their selves brought into being. Changing political and economic factors challenge social connections and collective affiliation, raising the stakes for commemorating communities facing fracture and dispersal. One effect was that Tasketas were increasingly also written outside of the purview of court patronage. Correspondingly, the figural presence of the author became more defined than in earlier texts. The act of writing such a text became almost autobiographical, but the self of Persianate autobiography was accumulated and continually redefined in the context of social relationships over a lifetime of learning, travel, and service. These texts evince a self in situ, um, in context, figured according to Adab's imperatives of moral self-fashioning, continually reiterated in conduct, in connection with the world. This was a Persian who could be affiliated with a multiplicity of places and have diverse origins that little resembled those demanded by nationalism. And I think it's important um, to remind ourselves that at the beginning of the 18th century, uh, Timurid's central power devolves onto um, more sort of local regional kingdoms all over the subcontinent. Um, and that the sort of the, the fate um, of these regional kingdoms um, sort of, there, there was a lot of political upheaval. There was a lot of movement of people between different places. Um, um, polities were changing in the neighboring regions in Iran and Central Asia. There was a lot of um, trans-regional migration. Um, and it was in this context in the middle of the 18th century that the British began to have their first military um, successes and took over the divan of Bengal and Orissa. And they sort of, for a time, 
um, began to kind of be one of these regional kingdoms, taking over the Nawabit of Bengal um, before they sort of began um, over the decades that followed uh, to flex greater and greater power over the subcontinent. Um, so the very act of remembering brings together memories in particular ways. Moreover, commemoration, commemoration is an act of memory undertaken together. The commemorative texts that are the sources in my book recollect various assortments of figures, inviting readers to join their authors in acts of remembering. Commemoration had a moral stake. Memory served to maintain mindful awareness, a deliberate action that, it ma that made it the guarantor of morality, which required discernment and judgment. To act accordingly in a given situation, one had to be able to remember from previous knowledge and experience. In turn, cultivating moral integrity guarded against memory's loss. Adab, proper ethical and aesthetic form, manifested as self's moral integrity through proper behavior and collective moral integrity through proper order or governance. As I discussed um, in, in an earlier chapter, adab could protect both selves and collectives from imbalanced humors resulting from extreme climates, intemperate, intemperate social conditions, or chaotic turns of fate. Similarly, proper ethical and aesthetic forms as actions in the world and as remembered narrative assemblages protected people individually and together from descent into immorality caused by forgetfulness. Thus, the importance of this lecture series to remember the shared past, one that has been closed off and divided for the last couple hundred years. One exemplary form of commemorative text, Tazketas, um, this is a genre that blossomed first in late 15th century Timurid Herat, um, and either standing alone as a text or in court chronicles or other sorts of texts, Tasketas vaunted the learned figures that adorned the courts of Persianate empires. They appeared in clusters where unstable times led to the need to record lives worthy of remembrance. These lives and the collectives they commemorated were communities of adab that manifested moral order. In times of upheaval or transition, um, which very much marked the 18th century, um, where moral lives were more difficult and in ethical subjects, connections more challenging to maintain. Tasket has preserved moral possibilities for better times. Perhaps unsurprisingly, as imperial structures began to unravel through the 18th century, the writing of these texts proliferated. Commemoration's moral significance point to its political stakes. Tasket has provided collective moral possibilities, and in their very multi multiplicity, each moral collective was more than itself. Its figures could and often did belong to other collectives. A poet was also a statesman or a Sufi, a poet of Esfahan or of Delhi. Hindus and women's, women were hierarchically differentiated from, but nevertheless placed together with Muslims and men. This supple and expansive plurality engendered by aporias of being and belonging allowed collectives to reassert themselves when political structures that sustain societies failed. Commemorative collectives could also be the basis out of which new political structures asserted themselves. So a lot of regional kingdoms, um, uh, you, you find Tasket as proliferating um, as, as some of the kind of first self-articulations of these new structures. As moral practice, commemoration created continuity and shored up collectives, functioning as political anchor in the absence of stable government. Tasketas assembled their subjects under different rubrics, all represented aesthetic and social communities through the selection and narration of members, which was a means of affiliation, allowing the author to utter I. Even when limited to locale or kingdom, most Tazketas included Persians from a variety of origins. Um, layered, overlapping, and multiple, the varied principles of organization 
do not allow any one of their distinctions, both within and between texts, primacy as an overarching category. Now, the poetic task today was just one type, um, but knowledge of poetry and ability to compose linked a wide variety of occupational classes and social positions. Unlike Tacitus centered on mystics or scholars um, or Tacitus fixed on courts, poetic Tacitus explicitly attended to an aesthetically and socially constituted collective of Persianate adab. Um, and this this included the learned and the literate and the elite, but also people of more modest uh, positions um, who may never have circulated within courts themselves. Their very scope and delimiting logic stage the diverse ways that collectives of adab could be imagined and the forms of Persianate selves these collectives could authorize. So we're coming back to uh, Lakshmi Narayan. Um, so his commemorative project um, is, exemplifies the expansive potentials of community. Um, Golerana was written in, in Orangabad and offers a vision of the way um, geographically located collectives fit together in a broader Persianate space. So um, I'm gonna refer to him by his tachalos, uh, as Shafiq. Um, Shafiq describes his Tazkere as concerned with, quote, versifiers born and raised in Hindustan, meaning, quote, those nightingales for whom the flowers they sing among is this garden, close quote. Among those he commemorates are Mughals, uh, and this is a term that referred to people whose fathers or other ancestors migrated to Hindustan from Iran and Turan. The text is divided into two sections, the first on Muslims and the second on Hindus, and he includes an entry uh, on himself in the second section. This commemorative focus may at first seem to reinforce the idea that Hindustanis are by definition born in Hindustan. To understand the place of these versifiers of Hindustan, however, we need to consider his larger commemorative project of which this was the middle installment Shafiq was also the author of two other Tazkaras, Chamanastan Sho'ara, Anrikhta Poets, and Shama Ghariban, concerned with, quote, people who came to Hindustan from elsewhere, close quote. He notes that in the introduction to the latter, after, that after writing Golerana on the poets of Hindustan, quote, the sweetly singing birds of this garden, um, he realized he needed to write another taskere, quote, another fresh sapling added to the path of discourse opposite the first sapling about this particular group, um, close quote, meaning poets who came to Hindustan. So different kinds of collectives adorn the space of Persian discourse, Hindus and Muslims, poets born here, and those who came from other Persianate regions. Place or lineage was not determin determinative, only multiplicity was overarching. From near or far, the distinction is not necessarily hierarchical. He says, quote, the first um, of the high ones who entered paradise-like Hindustan is Adam, close quote, whom he calls the father of mankind and a poet. His original residence was heaven, and though there is debate about where he alighted to earth, Shafiq cites the Quran's account as authoritative and provides an interpretation of the relevant verses to mean that he alighted on Sarandib Hind, or the Ceylon of Hind. And from there, he lived until the end of his life. So this is a common story repeated in Persian texts since at least the 16th century. But with Shafiq's ability to versify it according to the Quran, its traditions of interpretation and Arabic philology in general, a mode of narration is connected, is connected with his origins, particularly with his teacher, the noted Arabic and Hadith scholar, Azad Bilgrami. So Golerana presents a collective organized by birth in Hindustan, even if subdivided into those who are, quote, poets defined by Islam, and those who are the versifiers defined by idols, close quote. 
Persian has other words for idol, but Shafiq uses the word um, uh, asnamion or sanam, which is the word used for beloveds in poetry, connoting that they are as beautiful and worthy of devotion as asnam or idols. Besides the sophistication of its rhymed pose, this articulation offers a parallel. Mozunan literally means those who harmonize, as in writing in metered verse. And noktepardazan literally means those who make subtle distinctions. Both qualities are integral to composing verse and are often used as, synon as synonyms for poets. Together, they are the two aporetic qualities necessary for verse its substantive subtle points, and its formal harmonious arrangement. Their adjectival counterparts, Hindus and Muslims, articulate the verse of Hindustan distinctly but together, according to the epistemology of Persianate Adab. Shafir can represent these two groups in a single taskere called Goleratna, fresh flowers, um, and envision it as a beautiful new shoot placed on one side of a garden path, facing another sapling, the counterpart taskera of poets who came to Hindustan from other lands. Both plantings are in addition to Shafiq's first taskera of Rikhda poets, called Chamanistan or Verdant Meadow, also written in Persian, as a mini plot ensconced within this larger garden of discourse. The garden space is Persianate Hindustan, though its path wends through other gardens as well. In its soil grows Persian and Rikhta poets, born here and born elsewhere, distinguished by their idols or their Islam. Not all lived out their lives in Hindustan. Such rigid exclusivities were unnecessary. Mughal was not the ruling dynasty's family name. That was a European innovation but a name for a migrant and their descendants who came to Hindustan and stayed. Mughals are split between Shafir's two taskeras of Persian poets. All Mughals were Muslims, and though some were born in Hindustan and some elsewhere, both groups, Mughal and Hindustani Muslims, along with Hindus, are included in his taskera of Rikhda poets. Shafir's Tatskidas show us collectives connected by separations that seeped into one another. Their shared space, Persianate Hindustan, is imagined as a garden made up of multiple faiths and birthplaces. Mughals grew from both beds along the garden pathways. Included is the great poet Sa'ib Tabrizi, who returned to Iran after only seven years in, in Timurid do, domains and became indelibly associated with the Safavid Shahs. But his patronage and social ties to Timurid men of power is also commemorated as part of Hindustan. Shafir occupies a different section of this garden. He was not a contemporary, but commemorates himself as part of the same larger space of Adab in Hindustan even as the garden contains those of Iran. Tasket is remember, but not in our historical sense. They remembered those who could write poetry according to the stakes of their present times, of a collective and its selves. Those selves were Persians, but Persian was not people from the place called Persia solely in European languages nor was it an attained truth for an individual or even a collective. It was a self that required continual and communicable identification. Instead of Persian as an identity, we can consider adab as the mode by which Persians identified. Narrated according to the adab of being in the world, Tasketas and their enactment of the third person as self were, the, were one way Persians said I though never alone. So as I hope is made clear, Persianate Selves makes a claim for what it meant to be Persian before nationalism, but it also addresses itself to the violence and exclusions of modern nationalist politics and the limitations of its forms of knowing. Ultimately, my contention is that we cannot find our way out of the conundrums of the present by only looking within modern limits.
I wanted to look at an earlier time when ways of seeing and being in the world were different, not to return to them, but as inspiration for imagining new ways forward from where we are today. So that's the book. I'm interested in your thoughts and questions. Um, as a number of the aspects of the argument about circulation, about adab, and about the constitution of a Persian world in material and imaginative terms are something that I'm working on in my next book. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banakia, for a beautiful uh, presentation of your book. Uh, there are a number of questions uh, which have been put up and I would request uh, the uh, listeners to please ask uh, the questions, whatever you have to ask, please write them down and send it to us on the Ganga Jamni link. Uh, there is a question by Nanak Ganguly. Uh, uh, he says that would like to bring to your notice that India, not Iran, became the world's major center of Persian dictionary production. Even the major anthology of Persian poetry in southern Punjab, not Central Asia. Uh, probably, I mean, that's a common knowledge and uh, uh, to add to what Tana Ganguly has written, uh, to all those who are listening before uh, Dr. Kia replies or explains, I would just say that uh, possibly the number of Persian uh, texts and manuscripts compiled in the Indian subcontinent was much more larger than they were ever written in the territory which is known as Iran. Amanakia, You're absolutely please. right. Um, and there's actually a wonderful article by Rajiv Kindra um, called This Noble Science. Um, and it, yeah. it, it's a very kind of systematic uh, review of uh, the, the practice of lexical writing of dictionaries as we call them now. But you know, they're not this quite the same as our modern concept of a dictionary. They're, they're sort of much richer um, and they're, they, they give much more information about language. Maybe they're closer to the Oxford English Dictionary um, than, than our usual uh, ones that we have at home. Um, but uh, it's absolutely true. And I would say even, even more than um, the, the fact of text production, I think especially by 1700, uh, you had many more Persian speakers in the Indian subcontinent uh, probably than in Central Asia and Iran put together. Um, so, I mean, th this was, um, if, if we want to talk about a language defining a place, um, you know, Hindustan is as much a Persian land as Iran or anywhere else. Um. Well, uh, to take it further, uh, uh, would you like to uh, explain, if possible, to the audience what was this Sabake Hindi, uh, which the Persian writers use for uh, the the the, the uh, uh, Indian, uh, you know, dialect or Indian verses? I mean, what that's was a very this large Hindi? question. <laughs> uh, I would I would get, I would say this. Yeah, sure. Sabke Hindi as a term is something that was invented by an Iranian nationalist at the beginning of the 20th century. It is not a historical term. Right, the, the phrase that the phrase that is used okay. in the the 16th, 17th, 18th century, 19th century, is tazegui. Yeah, that and it, it you know and tazegui right. was something that um, it, it was a style of poetic uh, writing that poets um, all over the Persian speaking world engaged in. But during this period of time, the centers of poetic production were in Hindustan, right? So people in Iran and Central Asia were also engaging in this style of poetic um, discourse. Not everybody, because other pe there were other sort of ways of speaking and, and poetic form. But this was really the sort of dominant, very exciting uh, mode of it. 
And it was um, one of the, the kind of big draws of Hindustan is that the center is a patronage for this style. I mean, really in the 17th and 18th century were largely Lahore and Delhi. Um, and and so this this sort of and it's only really in the 20th century that it gets marked as Sapke Hindi, um, which is you know according to a different set of nationalist concerns, when um, Iranians are trying to make Persian as an exclusively Iranian language, right? Um, and and that style of writing Sapk means sort of style. Um, gets relegated to India because they're trying to cut it out of the literary canon. Uh, so they have to make it foreign. Uh, right. Yeah, but, uh, but you would agree that India was a crucible where the Sanskrit and the Persian literature and languages and culture yeah. came to mix together. Uh, uh, you know, that is one of the questions which Nana Ganguly is once again asking. And how the two cosmos merged? Um, Sanskrit I mean, and you've Persian. already had Richard Eaton speak to you about this, and that is a major focus of his new book, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, my 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 issue mm -hmm. here is simply that um, there has been there is a uh, we we don't have a great idea of what we can call Indo-Persian yet. This is often a term that gets used in different ways. Sometimes it refers to the writing of poets born in India or that are understood to be really Indian, which gets very, very messy. Um, and the problem with this is that some poets born in India do not write in Tazegui, right? Um, so to equate um, something like Indo-Persian with what calls, comes to later be called Sapke Hindi is problematic. Um, because people in Iran are writing in that form and some people in India are not, right? Um, so it, it, then it becomes marked, some people use Indo-Persian as any Persian written in India, even if you have arrived from somewhere else, you know, two days ago and you write something. Um, and, and then a third way that it, it is usually defined comes to be um, anything that is understood to have Indic uh, elements. But what does this actually mean? And so the question is, if you're bringing in Sanskrit elements, then you're writing in Indo-Persian. Um, but I think that that's actually very, very restrictive. Um, because I think that there were, that what is understood to be local, um, to regions of the subcontinent is something that, um, was much broader because Tazegui was really, Tazegui means newness. So it was about different kinds of innovation that weren't solely limited to, um, you know, melding things from Sanskrit. Um, a lot of times it was other kinds of local traditions, or it may have just been um, other forms of um, metrical, um, imaginative, metaphorical innovation, right? Um, and I think that allowing a greater space is very helpful. I think that it is much more useful to understand what is specific to regions of the subcontinent. And I don't think we can necessarily say there's something Indian going on. There may be some things going on in North India that were not going on in South India or, or vice versa. Um, but I think that we can't know what is specific to more regional and local contexts until we know what was shared. Right, right. Uh, there is a question by Miss uh, mm. Lubna Irfan. Uh, Ma'am, I wanted to ask about the way the migrants of 18th century took the notions of familiar spaces with them. A migrant from Delhi mentions in an 18th century Masnavi that the market of Faizabad puts the market of Shah Jahanabad to shame. How do we look um, at such comparisons? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think that one of the things that I found very interesting is the way in which homelands are really um, understood to be things like cities. People, people didn't, um, people moved across regions. I remember famously in, in Muhammad Mir Tarimir's 
um, uh, Zekremir, when he goes um, from Agra to Delhi, he talks about the sadness of exile breaking his heart. And these are not, this is not what we usually associate with, with leaving home and being in exile. Um, and, you know, uh, but I, I do think we need to sort of take that seriously and, and understand that when people are going, you know, from uh, Delhi to Faisabad, I mean, th it, there's also a kind of political and moral sense going on, right? In the 18th century, um, Delhi is under amazing number of attacks from the mid-century onward, whether it's Nadir Shah or uh, uh, Shah Durrani, right? Um, and and there was a, a very um, acute sense of um, Delhi uh, kind of being in a diminished state. Um, and there was a kind of migration of people moving outward to regional centers. But there was also a defense of Delhi going on, right? And so one of the things that you could see is a, a lot of kind of competitive uh, evaluations of places that can take place. Um, over this affiliation with homeland, right? Or the, the current homeland, which could have been uh, Delhi and somebody going to Faisabad and saying, no, 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 <laughs> you know? or vice versa, right? Um, so, I mean, I think it's, I think it's important. It, it doesn't really make sense if we're thinking about a national space as much, but it makes sense if we sort of understand that Yes, they, they could be of Hindustan and also be of their particular smaller homelands. Right. There's a question by Ashok Mathur. Uh, what has been the reasons that Hindustan or India assimilated Farsi as a language more than any other civilization for that matter? I mean, this is a question which I think Many uh, people uh, would so, be asked. So um, I, I, I'm taking the question to be about uh, how and why does Persian become so important in India? Um, I mean, yeah. In, yeah. In this, yeah. it's not happening to India alone, yeah? Um, in the language that we understand as mm -hmm. Farsi, uh, it, it kind of comes out of... Um, it, it is it is primarily spoken in places um, in um, central A what's now Central Asia and Khorasan, the Eastern Iranian domains, and and a little bit Afghanistan too. Um, and about a thousand years ago, um, when the Abbasid Empire begins to decentralize, certain regional sultanates at the eastern edge of it begin to use Persian. Um, as uh, a sort of court language. Um, and this, this begins with the Samanids and the Ghaznavids, right? And the Ghaznavids come into India. And uh, very quickly, Lahore, they, they conquer the Punjab and Lahore becomes the, their second capital. Um, and during this period of time, it's really a, a sort of language of regional rule. But after the um, Ilkhanids, the Mongols come and... Um, wipe out the Abbasid Caliphate, um, they, in the, the sort of hundred years that they're ruling over the course of which they do convert, but not until quite late, um, they begin to fashion Persian uh, into a language which after their um, rule kind of disintegrates, uh, Persian takes on um, the status of a kind of imperial language and of a trans-regional lingua franca. Um, and it begins to circulate in a particular way so that when a lot of new, it, it becomes a kind of language that a lot of new polities in the aftermath of Mongol rule adopt for their, um, for their administration and their court language. But it also becomes, um, because something else that happens in the aftermath of the Mongols is the, the rise and proliferation and ubiquity of Sufi orders. And, and these orders also begin, you know, being um, a Sufi master and uh, being able to compose texts and per poetry in Persian become very closely linked activities and statuses. And, and so with Sufism and with the um, arrival of uh, Muslim dynasties in 
um, in the subcontinent, but also across Central Asia. You know, when you start having Central Asia, um, especially in the kind of deeper regions, undergoes a conversion um, at the same time that, uh, you know, Muslim rulers are arriving in India um, and uh, the Persian language travels with them. Um, right. Uh, there is a question by Dr. Sayyid Ali Kazim. Uh, he teaches at Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, the question regards Shah Abbas's annual visit to Mazandaran. Mm -hmm. Was it uh, about being Firdaus's, uh, Firdaus's Amin or to tell the Ottoman to stay in their limit as these areas had always been targeted by Ottomans? It's a, it's a sort of a political question which is yeah, um, I mean, the, the Ottomans never made it to Mazandaran. Um, the, the sort of contested areas were more the Caucasus and what's now Azerbaijan. Um, and uh, Mazandaran was actually where his mother was from. Shah Abbas's mother was from Mazandaran, from a sort of local uh, ruling family. And that's kind of his, at least this is how it's attributed in the sources that he um, was filled with a desire to go back to this paradise land. Um, and he built the infrastructure to allow that to be possible. But the Ottomans, I mean, a lot of the border wars between the Ottomans um, and the Safavids, it, it never arrived in. Uh, Mazandaran is directly underneath the Caspian. So that's a little bit um, further east than they ever made it. Uh -huh. There's a question uh, from... Uh, uh, Jamia Millia Islamia, Roma Javed Rashid. Uh -huh. Dr. Rashid asks, uh, you have wonderfully detached the category of Persianate from its modern geographical connotations. My question is, how aware were the people of Iranian origin of this kind of categorization? I say this because I find the likes of Hazim and Behbahani very aware of their distinct Iranian identities. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I do talk about Hazin and Behbahani in, in my book, um, and I have looked at their um, writings very closely. Um, and I speak a little bit more about Hazin in particular in my next book, um, particularly in the context of the poetic debates that he engaged in in Delhi very acrimoniously. Um, I, I would say that I would I would say that there um, first of all I don't think we can talk about identities in a pre-modern context right people had affiliations then they identified themselves in particular ways but the modern concept of identity is a very uh, it's a notion that um, some sort of identity tells the truth of you in a determinative way and I don't think we have that yet. Um, I do think also that reading their text, someone like Behbahani, I, he does not identify himself as Iranian. He has a number of different affiliations. Um, and one of the things I talk about is that even the nisba that he uses uh, of Behbahan is only where his grandfather lived uh, for two and a half decades in the middle of his life. And his father, his grandfather is the famous scholar and so he takes that nisba, but you know his relationship with Behbahan is non-existent. Um, he himself is born in Kermanshah Shah and travels around a lot. Um, one of the things I do find in his writing, for instance, um, Ahmad Behbahani is a Shi'i mujtahid that comes um, from, he circulates through uh, Arak and Iran, and he comes to uh, Hindustan and he stays for five years and he travels to various um, regional centers. Um, but one of the things I find, uh, he marries, you know, he has uh, relatives in Bengal. Um, but one of the things I find about his writing is that um, he will curse other Shi'i uh, Iranians in Hindustan and he very much lauds the actions of his Hindu students. Um, and he does this because the thing that is most definitive for him is not nationality. The thing that is definitive for him is their adab. So the Iranian he curses is somebody who betrayed his master, who was somebody in Tipu Sultan's army. 
right? Um, and the person that he uh, praises is his student, his Hindu student that he has been reading Akhlaq uh, al with, um, who comes to visit him after he's been robbed and is very, you know, solicitous of his well being. So to me, that seemed much more important than their Iranianness, and which is not Iranianness is something that they don't necessarily talk about, even if they talk about places in Iran. Uh, right. Uh, there's a question by Zainab Vani. Mm. Uh, dear ma'am, uh, do we have poems, particularly in Mastami form, written by poet Saib Tabrezi, similar in nature to Kashmiri poems of the 17th century? As we know, many of his contemporaries and even his patron in Hindustan, Zafar Khan Ahsan wrote poems of this genre in Masnavi form. Um, I'm not sure which uh, Masnavi poems um, of 17th century Kashmir you're speaking of. Are, are we talking about Sarinames or... Um, I, I have to say that I'm not familiar enough with his corpus outside of Ghazals uh, to really answer that question. Um, but the, the, the sort of place to look for um, the scholar who is the kind of prominent Sa'ib Tabrizi scholar now is Paul Lozensky, um, who would be the one to know about this. Um, but I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Uh, well, uh, the, um, Mehru Jafar uh, asks, uh, South Asia has had deep contacts with pre-Islamic Persia. How much of Farsi in pre-Islamic times was spoken in India before the arrival of Persian Muslim warriors and scholars? So um, the language that we understand as Farsi now um, in English is referred to as New Persian even though it's not very new. <laughs> um, and it's something that is understood to have merge, emerged um, after um, I Iran was conquered by um, and, and converted to Islam. And it's a, it's a distinct product of a kind of interaction of Middle Persian, um, which is written in a totally different script and is, is really quite different. Um, it emerges out of the interaction between Middle Persian and Arabic. Um, and and so th there wasn't um, Farsi as we know it now um, didn't exist anywhere um, before uh, Islam. Um, and the earliest uh, the earliest New Persian writing we have is actually I think dates from the eighth century um, and is actually written in Judeo Persian in Hebrew script. Um, so, you know, it, it took a while because after um, after the Muslim conquest in Iran, Arabic became the language that was the language of learning for the first about three centuries. Um, so I, I don't know if Middle Persian was circulating um, in India before Islam. That's a, a bit before uh, what I would be able to tell you, but I can tell you Farsi as New Persian wasn't anywhere. Well, Meru Jafar, I mean, I would add to what uh, uh, Dr. Manakia has uh, just uh, said to you. Uh, I would recommend that please go through a work edited by Professor Irfan Habib on Indo-Iran uh, relations, uh, which was a product of a seminar which was uh, held uh, around a decade back. Uh, and Professor Habib, in one of his uh, you know, uh, papers which he contributed uh, to this volume has ably showed that uh, the uh, influence of the Iranian language and culture on the Indian subcontinent, in fact, appears from the Rig Vedic period itself. I mean, we had very close relationship, so much so that that a large number of concepts which are there in Rig Ved are, in fact, derived from Zendavesta. The terms, the concepts, uh, uh, even in fact, some of the, I mean, because both these languages, Sanskrit and the old uh, uh, Persian in which Zindavesta were being written, were sister languages. So in that uh, particular book, I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Manakia is tracing uh, 
the history of this uh, from 17 to 18 centuries. But uh, for uh, a description of the earlier period, please uh, refer to this volume. I think you will get much information uh, uh, there on this uh, particular theme. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Kia, I mean, uh, there are a lot of questions which can be put up to you. Uh, 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 for example, uh, there is a question, could you elaborate more on Lachmi Mathur, uh, which uh, Ashok Mathur is asking, uh, uh, can you elaborate more? So you will uh, take it up. But uh, before you start uh, uh, taking up what Ashok Mathur is asking, I would uh, uh, ask a very uh, basic question that you mentioned a number of uh, these non-Muslim scholars who were writing in Persian. Mm -hmm. They were part of the Persian Adab, as you rightly pointed out. Uh, uh, for all practical purposes, they were writing they, using that language. They were using that culture. They were part of it. But then what was their self-perception? Uh, 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 who were, I mean, these people who were nurturing the Persianate culture, did they take their selves as Persian? Did they take themselves to be Hindustani? Or did they take themselves to be what uh, later on came to be known as Mughal or Timur? Um, I mean, I would say that uh, you don't necessarily have to put an or, hmm. right? Um, I, the, I think the main difference of the period that I'm looking at and now is that one could be Persian and Hindustani, hmm. right? Um, and I, I mean, I, I don't think, I, and, and if they were in Timurid service, that was very important to them because the idea of service is very important, right? And defines who you are, who you are in service to. Um, and and any discussion and you know th there there are so many non-Muslims that are writing and we have these texts and you know who they're in service to um, is very important who they're connected to either in learning in patronage in service depending on what their occupation is um, these are very important things um, but they are. Um, they are Hindustani or they are, you know, they can be linked more to their um, smaller regions, um, but they're Hindustani, they are Persian, um, and these things were not mutually exclusive. I do think um, it, it is important to understand that Mughal is a particular category of people that not everybody was, right? Um, but uh, Lakshmi Narayan identifies himself as one of the Farsi Guyan. I mean, that's very clear. Um, and I gave you the example where he, this is his biographical representation of himself that I was quoting from, right? And before he even mentions his own birth, this is the sort of lineage as he gives it. Um, and it's very telling that the terms and the people that he evokes as important and his natal lineage and his relationship and ties and history are there. Um, but they are also... Um, supplemented and framed and narrated according to other people that we don't normally understand as part of one's lineage, right? Um, but but he is an example of something of a phenomena that's very common. Right, uh, ma'am. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Ashok Mathur insists that uh, can you elaborate on Lachmi Mathur, please? But I'm not sure what you want me to elaborate on. Yeah, I mean, I'm also not very sure. So, um, um, Mr. Ashok, can you please elaborate on your question? Uh, that would be much better if you can elaborate on it a little so that we may understand what actually you are going to ask. So before you uh, formulate that, uh, let me uh, take uh, Dr. Kia uh, to one of my uh, you know, concerns. Uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, uh, Mughal and Persian relations, uh, they're uh, intermingling, they're coming together, uh, as you rightly pointed out, uh, was not only confined to 18th century, but was continuing from well before that time. Uh, 
uh, you know while uh, you know i wrote a chapter once on iranian uh, migration to india mm. the uh, iranian emigres in which i tried to study uh, the the uh, nobility the poets the artists um, and others uh, architects for that matter who migrated from persia and came to uh, india and uh, uh, were incorporated into the mughal empire now uh, during the period of jahangir uh, i found a reference i'm sorry i am forgetting the actual source from where i got this passage uh, while you were giving your lecture i mean the stock i was trying to hunt for it but uh, somehow was unable to find that uh, uh, proper reference to the source but there is a dialogue uh, which goes on between uh, a person zainul beg who was the persian envoy uh, to the court of jahangir and abdul latif abbasi who was a protocol officer who was assigned the duty of uh, receiving this ambassador uh, and uh, uh, this ambassador along with this protocol officer uh what uh, were at uh, the tomb of akbar and uh, you know very uh, there's a very interesting description uh, where the protocol officer is in fact telling the uh, ambassador uh, the, uh, how to uh, i mean pay obeisance at the tomb uh, uh, what was the comportment while visiting the grave of the emperor Mm. incidentally both uh, zainul beg naturally being the envoy the persian envoy and latif abbasi both of them were iranian of iranian origin latif abbasi had also migrated of some time back some decades back from and the ambassador was not considering him to be iranian enough and there is a i mean dialogue which uh, goes on between the two Uh, which highlights uh, the difference between uh, those who had migrated from persia earlier and those who were uh, very recently coming from iran for example i just quote a passage then he that is zain as uh, zainul beg asked where do you hail from and uh, the uh, protocol officer latif abbasi said i am a baghdadi by origin but my birth place is india and khwaja mohammad mirak is a mashadi he said baghdadi is called iraqi arab and the term two iraqs is well known are you two in fact from iraq to this my reply was that the the, the reply of the pro- protocol officer was yes the country of iraq also belongs to his majesty jahangir padshah and the shah of iran also does not consider him to be different from him we are also among you and you are also from amongst us so i mean that uh, i mean uh, this passage uh, um, maybe it doesn't fit here but i just wanted to read it out to show that the uh, iranians both the type those who were coming only uh, a few days back and those who had come here decades ago but settled in india they thought themselves uh, differently though both were persian both were talking in farsi but were i mean behaving towards each other as they are of different nationalities so uh, possibly uh, this also defines the relationship of all those persians uh, who uh, you may call are non iranians they are persians by culture but but not necessarily iranians as a nationality uh, professor uh, uh, dr uh, kia i don't know how uh, you would uh, take this example but i was very interested to know your take on uh, this particular episode which i have uh, narrated uh, because i take it as a point of difference between the two cultures um 
I mean, that's a very interesting text and I would love the reference later. Um, I will give it to you, yeah. I have used it in one of my papers. I will send that to you. But the the thing is, is I was actually struck by him saying that we're the same amongst you and you amongst us. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what I mean um, in the beginning of my talk when I said that there's a kind of simulta simultaneous, there's a kind of competition because what you're speaking of is also an imperial context, right? And we know, for instance, there's the famous paintings that Jahangir commissioned with himself and Shah Abbas, right? Um, and, and, you know, th there is a kind of imperial rivalry that, that is taking place. And these are um, an envoy and the royal protocol uh, officer. So there there is also some rivalry being articulated there. But you can also think about that as a kind of political rivalry. And if we pull the frame back, the, the articulation also of what's going on, I mean, that's being done in, in imperial terms. But there's also this thing about how, you know, we are amongst you and you are amongst us. Um, I would say that this is an internal rivalry to culture, right? And that we can't equate political rivalry and cultural um, separateness. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right? Political and cultural are two different aspects, which, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's it, it's all too easy to kind of link them together because in a certain sense, that's the way it is in our world of nation states, um, or, or it attempts to be. But I, but I actually think that if we suspend that linkage, um, we can see that there's there's other things going on there, that there's also a, a commonality being articulated. Uh, well, are there any other questions? Uh, if they are, please put, put them up on the screen. Uh, yes, this is one of the paintings which you are referring to. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, very symbolically, you know, um, uh, the Indian Mughal emperor uh, is on the lion. Uh, the poor Abbasid, uh, the, 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 the Safavid ruler is on a sheep, a lamb. Uh, 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 the Mughal emperor is hefty, he's taller. <laughs> <laughs> but and the other one is a little, you know, suppressed. But then both of them are uh, in that golden halo. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, um, Shah Abbas also commissioned similar paintings. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, it, in his paintings, his mustache is much bigger than Jahangir's. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so these are competitive, you know, but they're still sitting together in the same that next to one another. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, uh, no, I don't think that uh, there are any. So I would take this opportunity uh, to thank you uh, once again uh, very much. Uh, it was uh, really a learning experience for all of us. And uh, unfortunately, although your book is easily available on Kindle, but uh, I think the physical volume uh, is still not available in India in general. Some, some of us do have it, but uh, in general, it is uh, still not available to the common students. And that was one of the reasons that uh, uh, we asked you to speak on this book so that people may become aware uh, about it. Uh, I would uh, just take one more minute to narrate uh, a personal you know, incident, uh, which reflects the same thing which we are discussing. A few years back, uh, there was a seminar uh, in Dushambe. Uh, in fact, in uh, 2002, not so, uh, I mean, a uh, number of years back, uh, where uh, I had uh, the good fortune of going and during that period, there was no direct flight to Dushambe, so we had to go via Tehran. Mm -hmm. I was accompanied by a number of uh, Indian historians. Um, amongst them was uh, one of my teachers, Professor uh, Zilli, 
इश्तिया हुसैन इश्तिया अहमद जिल्ली हु इज अ वेरी साउंड स्कॉलर ऑफ ऑफ पर्शियन लैंग्वेज एज वेल ही इज एट दी मोमेंट द डायरेक्टर ऑफ द शिबली एकेडमी इन आजमगढ़ सो ही वाज अलोंग विद मी uh so uh, we had to go from our hotel uh, to tehran university uh, where just before the uh, tehran university gate there are a number of bookshops and both of us were interested in bu- buying certain of the books which are otherwise not available in india so we i stopped a taxi wala and asked my ustad uh, zilli sahab Uh, to converse with the driver and explain where we have to go and zilli sahab uh, for 2 3 minutes spoke in persian uh, and it was such a persian that i was in fact admiring my ustad that he is speaking so fluently so well and I, i was in fact admiring him but i was amazed when the driver gave an answer uh, the driver said aga man hindustani me hindustani na me do na i don't know <laughs> you know then we realized that professor zilli being uh, you know a person who had worked on mogul sources was he speaking that classical persian a persian in which uh, books like uh, akbar name had been written and today in modern iran the persian which is spoken is very very different yes. from the classical persian which the safavids wrote or what the moguls uh, wrote in in fact related with that is the fact that in our hotel room uh, our television we had the televisions uh, in those rooms unfortunately all the time on the television either it was the news or some mulla uh given the sermons uh and uh, you know uh, i have worked on the moguls so i can somehow read some persian i don't claim to be uh, an expert in persian but somehow hijje i can just make out what is written there for myself uh so uh, you know i was surprised that when the news was going on the modern persian i could not understand a single word what what uh, the 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 news person was saying but when the mullah was giving his uh, you know uh, speech half of it i could relate to i could understand because that is the way that the shia mullahs of today in lucknow and other places recite the majlis and half the words i was in fact uh, aware of not only from the persian sources but also from the mullahs of india so you know uh, the uh, uh, language i mean uh, naturally you are talking about the 18th century today uh, we have forgotten all traces of uh, the uh, persian which was known in india there is hardly anyone who knows persian but whatever persian the scholars of india even the talaffuz is very different uh, uh, some of the things which you would be talking about in persian to indians you would have to pronounce it different differently rather than when you pronounce it while before an iranian audience so naturally through this we can understand that although the cultures were the same uh, there was you know um, the the uh, migration of languages uh, they, they were being imbibed they were being accepted but naturally the local uh, you know elements were influencing them and uh, naturally apart from the fact that both of them represented a persian culture but the mogul indian culture uh, in spite of the fact that it had a heavy influence of the persians was quite distinct from the uh, persian culture which was there uh, under the safavid empire that is my uh, reading of the situation after having uh, read uh, through whatever i could uh, for the 17th century and 18th century uh dr manakia uh, the uh, way you described uh, those poets and writers of the 18th century thanks a lot because that is a field uh, i have heard those names being mentioned by certain of the people who have worked on 18th century 
at Aligarh, for, for example, as I referred before to you when before the lecture, there was one Professor Muhammad Umar. He had uh, written a book on 18th century uh, culture, uh, Mughal culture of 18th century. Uh, uh, there are other works also uh, where uh, of the Persian department who have uh, taken up these uh, particular sources for a detailed study. But the way you analyze them from a particular perspective, thank you very much. I really uh, uh, want more, uh, the students who are dealing with the Mughal period or, or the late Mughal period, one can say the pre-modern uh, history of India. I would recommend that all of you please do read this book because it has a mine of information. Thank you very much. And I hope that in future also you will remain connected with us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I'm deeply honored to have been invited to speak and I have really enjoyed uh, the opportunity and the questions. And just to answer Mehru Jafar, yes, Ferdosi Shahname is in New Persian. It's, it's one of the, the earlier texts written in that language. Um, well, thank you and have a good evening, everybody. And, uh, you know, in hopes that we'll be able to, to continue in other ways again. <laughs> So, Adab and stay and goodbye. Good night. Adab, but you know, there has been a question. It's a persistent question that has come. Um, what I know, it's it's it it's a big one. But what exactly is Farsi culture? What are the aspects of Farsi culture? If we if we don't talk about language alone, let me. I also got a text about this. So, um, what are the elements of Persian? Um, in Indian culture without the language? Um, I mean, one of the reasons Persianate is a helpful concept um, is because it allows us to think outside of the Persian language too. Um, and one of the arguments that I make is that um, at the root of Persian, the, the sort of way I conceptualize it is through the concept of adab and in the particular ways. Now, many, many of the basic stories um, that came um, in Persian also uh, were translated into other languages, into Hindustani, into Punjabi, into Bengali, um, in, into a number of other languages. You know, we can think of um, uh, uh, Leili Majnun, we can think of um, uh, Yosef and Zulekha, for instance. You can think of the, the kinds of things that sort of circulated, ideas that circulated. Um, but adab, right, a, a certain idea, uh, adab, <laughs> um, is, is an important concept. Um, and I think that that does also circulate beyond the Persian language and all of the things that that constitutes. Um, but I'll leave it there because that is a very big question. Um, well, uh, to uh, once again end it, uh, uh, there is yet another question uh, which Mehru Jafar had asked. Yeah. Uh, 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 she says, Biryani is part of the Persian culture in Hindustan. Uh, but I would like to remind Mehru Jafar that in India, Biryani is basically a rice preparation. Uh, in some parts of uh, Iran, biryani is something which is only meat and no rice. So there are, uh, you know, b b yes. Oh. Uh, uh, so there are, you know, uh, uh, borrowings, but sometimes the terms remain the same, but uh, the things uh, start changing much. Mm. Uh, I, I, I had, in fact, uh, Dr. Kia ordered a biryani in one part of Iran, and I was surprised when I got, uh, you know, a bread uh, with kebabs on top of that. And when I said, no, no, I didn't order this. I ordered biryani. He said, this is biryani in this particular region. I, mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> I have to say, though, I have to say that there is a great deal of regional variation in Iran. There are places where there is no rice. It does not grow, right? <laughs> and I think that, that goes also for... Um, things like language and pronunciation before the 20th century, before mass media, um, mm. 
uh, the pronunciation of Persian within the regions of Iran were wildly different. And you can see this actually in the lexicographical literature in, in, um, in different kinds of Tasketas, they say um, so-and-so grew up in Mashhad and his Persian is ruined. And this is somebody writing in Adar Ajam, you know? And so, so there are, you know, that, that sort of uh, variation of uh, pronunciation um, I don't think is necessarily a massive difference between Iran and India insofar as before the modern era, you have differences within larger kingdoms, right? These are empires, um, right? So th that variation is just part of it. And you can still definitely see that within Iran with food. When I've traveled, I was born in Tehran, uh, but when I've traveled to other regions, I'm routinely confronted with food that is uh, unfamiliar to me. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Well, I think uh, we should end here because otherwise uh, there would be question after question. Uh, so there's no end to that. Uh, let us leave the questions from another, for another session. We would uh, actually request uh, Dr. Kia uh, that, uh, well, uh, when you write your other book, uh, please do share it with us. We would be really interested uh, yes, in, to learn more about it. And do visit India sometime after this pandemic. <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, we would like to host you at Aliga. Thank you very much. It would be my pleasure and my honor. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sir, would you like to announce uh, the talks next week? Well, uh, uh, next week uh, we have a number of uh, very uh, you know interesting lectures which are due. For example, uh, we have on 27th of November, uh, um, Professor Farhat Hassan. Uh, literacy and the shaping of manuscript culture. Problems in reading of mobile sources. So that would be uh, uh, really a very basic lecture where uh, Professor Hassan would be telling us how to handle the sources, uh, the mobile sources, Persian sources. Basic but essential would... writing because that's the whole purpose of sharing the sources with sources to study medieval Indian history with uh, with the audience. And I think it's it's a lecture that you all should attend and um, it would be worth the while. Then, sir, also on Sunday. Then, then, then you know, uh, on Sunday, uh, there would be another very good uh, uh, speaker with us. Uh, a speaker which otherwise is not very accessible to any of us in India. She is Dr. Corinne Lefebvre. Uh, uh, she is a young scholar who has uh, uh, recently written a book on Jahangir. Uh, and uh, as all of you, probably all those who are studying medieval Indian history would be knowing that uh, we are paying much more stress on Akbar than on anybody else. When we talk about, about Mughals, uh, the, even the rickshawala understands about Taj Mahal and they know about Akbar. But most of us forget everything about uh, Jahangir except his love affair with Nur Jahan. But, uh, you know, Corinne Lefebvre has a remarkable book, a new take on uh, Jahangir. Unfortunately for us, that book is still in French. It is written in French. And I think it would not be more uh, less than one year or more than that, that she would be getting it translated into English. Now, she is going to present uh, Islam and Empire in India, the Padshah's sacred authority. So that would be something out of her book. And... Uh, that's once in a lifetime, uh, you know, opportunity for us to listen to her, what she has to say. Generally, most of her articles, except a few, uh, 
they are in French. Uh, she has written some of them, but all in journals which again are not generally found uh, popularly in India. They are in English, but we would have her uh, with us and she would be delivering a lecture on 29th of November. So these are the two programs for the next week. And ho I hope that all of you would join in and listen to what these two great scholars have to tell us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please join us on Fridays at 7 and Sundays at 7 for our series on reflections on our shared past and sources of medieval history. So as uh, Sir said that this is a rare opportunity to hear a scholar whose books are also not trans. The latest book is not translated yet. And please um, stay with us for a fabulous illustrated, very richly illustrated lecture. So uh, we look forward to sun having you all on Sunday and Friday at seven. Thank you all for joining us today and um, have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night.